Gladys. I want you to tell us about your father and mother because it relates to what Ron just talked about and the women coming here. And then tell about what it was like to be a child, or you as a child, in this neighborhood. Well, um, from the stories my brother used to tell me, um, the gambling started in the arcade. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, but my father had gambling in the back of his store. <laughs> and uh, of course there were quite a few police raids. And I happened to remember one night, people running through our house. Well, my father had built our the store, we owned a store next to the Shanghai restaurant. And there was a back room and he built a door that opened to the coal bin of the house that we rented. <laughs> And in the middle of the night, when there was a raid, the gamblers come running through the back door, through the basement of our house, and up the front stairs. And one night I woke up and I saw all these men running through the house. And it kind of scared me. But uh, there were quite a bit of gambling going on. My brother told me that uh, back in the 40s, the arcade had heavy gambling. Now tell us about your your older brothers and your uh, your father uh, going back for your mother. Well, from the stories I heard, my father came over as a teenager. Uh, he had an older brother, much older, who brought him over here, and uh, he worked and he went back and forth and he went back to get married. Had my oldest brother, left my mother in China, came back to the states. And then a few years went back again, and my number two brother was born. <laughs> <Didn't run. laughs> and then he would come back. And then finally, when uh, the Japanese invaded, he brought my mother over in 1937, I believe. And a year later, I was born, the love child. <laughs> and that was it. So tell us uh, about your playing in the neighborhood. Well. We three grew up in the same building, or we started out that way anyway, at 202 Mulberry. I lived on, we lived on the first floor, Frank lived on the second, and I think Harold lived on the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I lived in that building until I was four years old, but I remember all these things. I have to admit, I was, forget about, I was all over the place. So, two, three, four, I was running around the Mulberry Street, all over the place. Uh, inside the Standard Restaurant, Mrs. Black's Grocery Store, and the Perez's Jewelry Store, all the restaurants. <laughs> I ate my way through Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> How about the firehouse? Oh, yes, the firehouse was uh, across Lafayette Street from our building. And I used to go over there. I guess I was like three or four. And the firemen used to let me go in and look around, and they let me slide down the pole a couple of times. <laughs> the only thing I didn't like about the firehouse were the Dalmatian dogs. Uh -huh. They're always sniffing. <laughs> um, tell us about the Chinese uh, language school that you went to. Uh, that was a that was different from the one Harold mentioned. They started one, I guess, after I moved. After Street. Yeah, it was on Green Street. You know? Yeah. Yeah, the school was in several different locations yeah, over there the course of the history of the community. But the school that we went to was like a one-room schoolhouse that taught all grades. The teacher came over from New York City, so it was different from Harold's. And what, and what, and Frank, you can chime in. What do you remember about it? Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> the one thing that I, I am sort of humorous because uh, the teachers were uh, brought from various areas in the, uh, the New York metropolitan area. And one teacher I remember, this was right uh, after World War II, and he was a very young fellow. Uh, and this gives you an idea of what the New York Chinatown community leaders were like. This young fellow came from uh, China, and he basically was a communist. Uh, he was very well educated, and I do remember very distinctly after the elders had brought him in to teach us, they realized they had brought in a communist. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and the elders were basically Republican. <laughs> All right. Um, and the controversy that ensued, because we loved the teacher. All right. And we learned a great deal about our um, heritage and our motherland from him. But it was not what our parents wanted us to learn. <laughs> All right, because what we were expected to be was to be this great Confucian scholar following this great Confucian ethic uh, to become mandarins. And that's not what this teacher was telling us. <laughs> Tell us about uh, your fathers, uh, Frank and Gladys, and what they did, their occupation and other members of your family extended. Uh, shall I start class? Yeah. Uh, Dad was a merchant in New York. Uh, my grandfather was a merchant at the corner of Columbia and Green Street. And my great-grandfather was also a ran a small grocery store uh, at Columbia and Hamilton Street. And my great-grandfather, who first came to Newark, and uh, this was in, right after the Civil War, 1866, before the Bellevue Laundry. And there were Chinese already living on Columbia Street in 1866. My great-great-grandfather was not the first. Uh, they came as workers uh, on the railroads, coming from the west to the east. My great, great, great grandfather came to California before the gold rush to work on the beet fields of the Spanish grandees. So the Chinese had been in California from, uh, uh, shortly, and Richard referred to it, the Taiping Rebellion. For those of you who do not know Chinese history, all of uh, China south of the Yangtze River was in rebellion, and was referred to as the Taiping Rebellion, and was led by a very colorful character, uh, possibly half Chinese, half white, who claimed he was a descendant, speaking for Jesus Christ. All right. <clears throat> Many of the people who lived in the four villages that you, Richard, showed supported the Taiping. And when the Taiping Rebellion failed, and this was just about the time of the, uh, the British Opium Wars, the Qing Dynasty took retribution on the southern uh, areas of China, and that began the, uh, the outward migration from the southern provinces. And the four villages that uh, Richard referred to supported the Taiping. And so many of our ancestors uh, left China uh, under duress and migrated into Southeast Asia and then to California. This was all before the Gold Rush. <coughs> okay. okay. Gladys, do you want to talk oh, about your family? My father. Um, inherited a grocery store from his brother and his older brother. And Harold neglected to mention it. It was right next to it, actually below the Shanghai restaurant. And uh, he ran that for, I guess, about seven, eight years. And then we uh, moved to Kearney. And that's when I left Newark when I was about 10. But I would come back every, every day or so. <laughs> I'd like you to each talk about elementary and high school. You all went to public schools then. They were outside of the neighborhood. Tell the people what schools you went to. And I'd also like to know what, um, if you felt that you uh, suffered from, uh, from discrimination in those schools. So, you want to go, Harold? Well, uh, I went to Chestnut Street School up until about the sixth grade. My father originally went there and became very friendly with the principal, uh, Mr. William Heineken, who is a descendant or a member of the Heineken beer family. And uh, then I was transferred 
to Lafayette Street School and went there from, at the sixth grade, being able to go ahead and skip the sixth, the sixth grade, went to seventh grade, and was the police patrol uh, on the corner of uh, McW McWhorter and Lafayette to, to help the students come from Chinatown across to going to Lafayette School. I later went on to, to uh, we moved to the Clinton Hill section and I graduated from Hawthorne Avenue and went to Madison Junior High and it was at, after that that uh, my dad made a contact and they decided that it was wiser for me to go to Westside High School since the 31 bus went up Market Street to Westside and I graduated from Westside in 1940 and then in 1941 I went to Blair Academy uh, because Dad wanted me to go to Yale and Princeton. And when I got there, why well, my headmaster, Mr. Walker, decided that it would be better for him for me to go to either Williams or Brown, and I was accepted on a half tuition scholarship to Brown University, where I stayed during six months. In which, being Chinese, they felt that it would be wise for me to take Japanese, and I would learn some Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't last that long and then finally my, I transferred to Virginia Tech and was accepted for the Medica Medical College of Virginia and then the draft board decided that they wanted me and I was drafted into the Army in 1943. In between, why, of course, we had air raids and I became a, a air raid warden and of course we all had to have our lights uh, blacked out at the upper half so that we wouldn't have the reflections of course to give the reflection of the community along the shore. Uh, the Chinese people in general during that period of time where the, where the Chinese were fighting the Japanese, why there were a lot of refugees and we as kids, why decided that we got to raise some money and we got together and had straight pins and then put a little red bow on it, or red ribbon on it, and that would signify your contribution. And we all either shine shoes or contributed some way to get some money for the refugees. Okay. Frank, Frank, why don't you talk about your lower school? Uh, <clears throat> I went to Lafayette Street School. And in fact, Gladys and I were just talking uh, while we were sitting here having dinner about Miss um, Hazlitt one of our teachers that we both had, who we, we got to love very much. And Miss Hazlitt was probably typical of the kind of teacher that we had at Lafayette Street School. Um, she imbued us with uh, a sense of what an American was to be like. <coughs> when we left public school, we came back into a Chinese community and our parents even though my father was American born, my mother was not, imbued us with what it was to be, quote, Chinese, unquote. Uh, I think the idea of having two cultures constantly being melded made us much stronger. And Lafayette Street School was almost an ideal incubator for that type of melding and that type of assimilation. And I think it's still a fairly decent school today. Mm -hmm. From Lafayette, I went to Eastside. And uh, Eastside, uh, when Ms. Hazlitt was an uh, Irish American Catholic. They had no other career opportunities. They, but the public school system gave them a decent living. And these women, in turn, taught us all right, and gave us the standards to follow. I'm, I'm not too sure that generation of teachers still exists today. Gladys, how about your school? Well, I went to Lafayette Street School until the fifth grade, and then I moved to Kearney, and grew up in this town where I was the only Asian girl in the whole town. And that was a little unusual, because I had never experienced not being with other Asians, Chinese, so it was kind of strange. But, I guess I came out okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I might add, I might add that before Gladys, when during my time, there was a farmer, there was a Chinese farmer in Carney who had a pig farm on, on Schuyler Avenue. She <laughs> used to come in every night and pick up the sewage, from, uh, the, the garbage from the Canton restaurant and take it back. And amongst those three children from that family, James, which was the oldest, older one, who went to Casey Jones School of Aeronautics, later became the vice president of engineering for Beechcraft. Oh, really? And, yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, the other brothers, I don't know. I happened to meet Jimmy on, a, on his retirement trip around the world in Hong Kong, and then we rode on the plane until I got to Hawaii, and then well, I went, got off and visited my classmate, who was the uh, assistant dental surgeon for the Pacific Theater. Is you had some friends in the neighborhood when you still lived in, on Mul uh, in the Mulberry neighborhood who weren't Chinese. Tell us about that. Oh, well, no, the friends were from the school, Ironbound section okay, of the to school. Um, I had a few Portuguese, there was Portuguese, Spanish friends from school, but they lived all the way down in the Ironbound section. All the friends around the neighborhood were all Chinese. Okay, and you said that um, in later years the arcade um, had uh, black people living there, I think. Um, yeah, they, what, what do you when remember? Oh, well, I think they were, I think African Americans came into Chinatown probably in the late 30s. Uh, Chinatown was, was not what I would call a homogenous community, as, as the pictures would indicate. Large portion of the population was Irish, Catholic, working class, uh, Hispanic, and there were African Americans as well. Um, the one thing was a community that, uh, despite its racial diversity, was quite tolerant of each other. And um, the one thing the the non-Chinese were aware of is. If any of the uh, the children misbehave, if any Chinese chalas for uh, in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, and and Chinatown was just simply one facet of that diversity. Okay, I'd like to um, open it up to questions. Um, there are a lot of people who have had experience with. Uh, Chinatown in this audience. So if anyone would have a question uh, to pose or a statement, yes, over here. Hi, Stand up and talk loud. Hi, my name is Jules Sloan. I live in New York. Uh, not a question. I'll, I'll make some statements. I, me and my family, we've been in New York since eight, about 1850. I still live in New York, so we've had a presence here ever since then. I was born in 1940. Uh, any, any weekend or whatever, I'd be downtown with, with my mother and father, and we'd go. Mulberry Street. We go to the Canton, we go to the Shanghai. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's dead, so I can tell her a little story. Every time we go there, uh, she would take a little, one of the little teacups and one of the little saucers, and she would put it into her pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, Mom, Mom, what are you doing? And she'd say, Shh. With a smile on her face, she'd say, They expect you to do that. <laughs> Okay, now there's any comment? Any, anybody? Yes, back there. Okay. Uh, I attended Lafayette Street School from 1940 to 1948. Uh, and, and my class, there were two Chinese Americans, remember James King and Jack Mudd. Uh, Lafayette had the nearest grammar school to the only, the only thing I know is that at the Far East restaurant was the one where the colored the people went to. Yeah, but you sat on one side and Mike sat well, on the other side. We weren't involved in that restaurant, but that's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back in the corner. Yes, Mike. Yeah, I'm Jimmy Uh, my grandfather opened up the Mandarin restaurant on 102 Market Street. And you're talking about the Royal Restaurant, sir? I do not remember the name of the restaurant. Well, that was, that was, 
that was a, a restaurant which was right next door to the Mandarin, and the Mandarin restaurant faced Washington Street across the street from the Old Bamberger. My grandfather used to walk with two bags, two rice bags tied on his feet, two separate, uh, and would shuffle up from Mulberry Street to Market Street to the restaurant. <laughs> I, I do not remember the name of the restaurant in New York, but I do know the names of the restaurants in Providence, Rhode Island, or Port Arthur and King's Point. Providence, Rhode Island? Okay. There was, okay. Well, there was a restaurant down the bottom of, of uh, the hill, which was a Chinese restaurant, which opened up on two streets. And I, I worked there as a waiter when I was at Brown. Okay, here's the uh, my name is Will. Um, I'm, a, I'm 48 years old. I was born in Claremont in Belleville, and I spent the first four years of my life on the ninth floor of a Columbus Apartments on 7th Avenue. Um, my, uh, it was told to me when uh, I was younger that my great-grandfather was the owner and proprietor of Han Cow Restaurant on Granford Place, which is pretty much contiguous with Edison Place, I, I guess, right across from the Bla uh, Branford Theater. Are you, an from the Are you an Anglican? Yes. Are you related to Susan? <laughs> Sam? Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's ironic that uh, having born and then been raised in uh, the south ward of Newark and Hillside, Married, moved away to Middlesex County, but attended college and now work in downtown Newark. And when I go to uh, the Prudential Center with my hockey playing 15-year-old son, <laughs> I'm sure somewhere the ghosts are looking down. At <laughs> Good. Speaking of uh, lugging the rice on the feet, this gentleman, I'd like you to tell me what you said before about what you did as a child. Stand up, tell us. <coughs> it's a little embarrassing. Tell us. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Stand up and tell us. I told this gentleman that uh, when I was 12 years old, I used to haul two gallons of hooch, <laughs> took the path to Newark, walked up to Canton Restaurant, and went down to the third basement as uh, my uncle gave me two bucks, <laughs> and I went home. <laughs> I was the youngest bootlegger around. <laughs> okay. uh, well, you said any other questions? This is just one more. Wait, wait, wait. Back here. My name is Tom. Uh, I also went to Lafayette Street. Also went to uh, Eastside. side uh, I, I remember my teacher from Lafayette was Marino. Does any, any one of you remember him? My grandfather came around 1910, and he owned a restaurant on Market Street. I think it's number 98. The name is Royal Chinese Restaurant. Shanghai, Ding Hao, uh, uh, Canton, Hang Kao. I came to, uh, I was in Green Street, 1959, there for about two or two, three years. Uh, the picture that, that you were showing, it was pretty much like that, 1959. And I, I, I came in from Hong Kong, so I, I'm a little different than most of you. <laughs> I, I, want to, I, I want to stop the question for uh, now, because I'd like to go to Frank, and I'd, I'd like to ask you, Frank, to tell us why Chinatown dissipated. Oh. <laughs> well, let's think about um, what was shown on the map, that um, the area in southern China where most of the residents of York's Chinatown came from were basically uh, Cantonese. And the Cantonese were among the first immigrant Chinese group in the United States. 
after World War II, and this is my own uh, theory, uh, economic opportunity opened up considerably for Chinese Americans after World War II. And after 1950, a great deal of the job discrimination disappeared. And as a result, <clears throat> North Chinatown basically began to disappear in the 1950s and was pretty much gone by 1960. The Kennedy round of immigration allowed many of the Chinatowns in this country to renew themselves. Uh, the Kennedy round of immigration law was, I think, 1961 or 62. That did not result in the renewal of Chinatown in Newark. Uh, it did promote a great deal of growth in New York's Chinatown, San Francisco's Chinatown, Chicago's Chinatown, but not Newark. And, and basically, uh, this is again my own take on it, the immigration was coming from China. And we have to understand it would be helpful if you don't think of China as a country. Think of China the same way you think of as Europe. 20 different countries came together 4,200 years ago to create a union. Basically what Europe is trying to do today, which is called the European Union, which really should be called the China Union. All right? And that union has lasted uh, Chinese civilization begins about around 3000 BC. By 2200 BC, the union is created. These 20 different countries have more or less stuck together. Now, the country that is Canton or Cantonese, think of as France and Northern Italy. Uh, the new immigration pattern coming in after the Kennedy round came from the other countries of China. And the basic answer why North Chinatown died, the, the economic assimilation, and basically why would a German immigrant want to live in Little Italy? All right, that is, as the immigrants were coming in from the other countries of China, they didn't want to live in uh, a French or an Italian community, or a Cantonese community. That is a natural process. That's my own opinion. Yeah, I was, uh, I was going to say, I grew up in North Newark, uh, you know, in the northern, the Italian section, but the northern Italian section. And I think probably what happened to China, I wonder if it's the same thing. If you look at the map of Newark, the Jewish section, the Italian section, they were all left. And wasn't it just a matter they had the opportunity to leave? Yeah. So that was probably why it disappeared, this suburbanization. Yeah. But so, I, I mean, all those communities went to... They, they got more affluent, and they got to live in, to live, go to bigger houses, yeah. and got more jobs. So it was, it, it is like you said, it's That's natural, it's natural. It's the uh, assimilation process for the United States. Uh, and keep this in mind, uh, by the 1950 census, if we look at the start, go back to the, uh, the work even the news, because I just simply remember, the, uh, Chinese American community is that the 1950 census achieved economic parity the white families of the United States. And if we look at the Star Ledger article that was printed last year, the Chinese American incomes in New Jersey are double the white community. And that basically explains, I think, why North Chinatown uh, disappeared. Just any final questions from people on the panel? I statements from people on the panel. Any comments that have come to mind since the questions were posed? I did want to make one point. New York City's Chinatown is very old. It started in 1780. Baltimore's Chinatown is even older, pre-Revolutionary War. And Bob asked me this question when I told him this, where did the Chinese come from? 
The Chinese were the stevedores and the sailors on the Spanish trading ships coming up from the Caribbean. And the East Coast Chinatowns are very old, much older than the West Coast Chinatowns. If you stand <clears throat> at the corner of Bowery and Pell, you have a very good idea why New York Chinatown is where it is today. Stand at that corner, turn south, look at the South Street Seaport, and you will see the masts of the China clipper ship, the Peking, at the South Street Seaport. What the Chinese stevedores did was they got off the boat, walked up two blocks, three blocks north, and settled. Um, so they, then, if you, if you follow the path, it's Baltimore first, Philadelphia, Chinatown was established right at the New York was 10 years later, Boston was 1800, and right up the coast following the China Trail. So the communities are very old. And uh, when I worked for Mayor Koch, one thing I did discover, quite by surprise, was I was being asked to uh, review the, the New York City archives. And you will, I discovered an advertisement in 1805 in the New York Observer for the appearance of Chinese Tintin's Opera Company. It was a large enough community in New York's Chinatown that a traveling Cantonese opera company was making the rounds of the East Coast Chinatowns. Okay, for those of you who have seen the movie Gangs of New York, which is basically 1860s about the Irish, the quintessential New Yorker, Martin Scorsese, made the movie, and uh, he was being interviewed on CNN one time, so oh, you put the Chinese in the movie because for color. And Martin Scorsese said, no, 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 no. The Chinese community was here before 1800. And they were right next to the five corners where the Irish community started in the 1840s.